What's up, guys? Welcome back to Spark to Fire. I'm your host, Landon Rhodes, and today we've got Brian Clayton with Green Pal on the show. Thanks for coming on today, bro. Landon, thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. Awesome. So Brian is a former lawn care professional turned tech entrepreneur, uh, and I, he has an awesome story. We were just chatting up a little bit before this, and I'd love for you to just kind of share that journey from starting off when you were a kid. What were you like? Were you like entrepreneurial? Uh, what, what, how were you when you were a kid? Yeah, uh, you know, I've spent 22 years in one industry, and uh, I think uh, authenticity can be a competitive advantage. Uh, today, I'm CEO, co-founder of Green Pal, the Uber for lawn mowing. But before that, uh, rewind back to the, the mid 90s, I started mowing yards in high school as a way to make extra cash. I was actually forced into entrepreneurship by my dad uh, on a hot summer day. He said, get off your butt. Uh, I got a gig for you. You're going to go mow the neighbor's yard. Made me go cut the neighbor's grass. Luckily, he did that because I made like $20 and I got hooked on business ownership. Uh, and I stuck with that little lawn mowing business and over a 15 year period of time, built one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee, uh, maybe even in the Southeast uh, of the United States. And and uh, got it to 150 employees, 10 million a year in revenue. And in 2013, sold that company to one of the big conglomerates in, in the United States that, that gobbles those time, kinds of businesses up. And so uh, building that business just from me and a push mower to 150 people, I learned a lot just through trial and error and how, how to grow and scale a business. And I sold it and took some time off and I thought, well, what now? And I did some self-reflection and I realized something about myself that I was wired to want to be in the game. I was wired to want to be a part of a project, something that, uh, that, I, that I could be proud of, that I could pour my soul into. And I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And I had the idea for uh, an app should exist like Airbnb and Uber, but for what I know, what this industry is that I've spent 15 years in. And I I thought, well, how hard could it be? How hard could it be to build an app? And luckily, I didn't know what I didn't know. It was kind of naivete as an asset, but recruited two co-founders, and we started working on the idea for Green Pal. And, and now here we are. We're a 10-year overnight success. We're nationwide in the United States, uh, around 300,000 people using this app, doing multiple eight figures a year in revenue, and we're self-funded. Um, and still growing fast. So it's been a hell of a ride. 20 something years in one industry. I've seen it from every angle you can see it from. Self-funded doing multiple, multiple millions of dollars per year, especially in the tech space is rare. It doesn't happen often. Um, but I think it's the best bet uh, founders can make. I think if you can figure out a way to fund the business off of its own revenues, keeps you focused on the customer, keeps you focused on on the things that matter, it clarifies your thinking. It can be harder, uh, it can take longer, but it certainly has worked out for us. Um, I'm not anti-venture capital, and I'm not anti-raising capital, but I think it can be a better bet for most founders to self-fund their business. So how many people, <laughs> how many people came up to you and offered you funding for this idea once it started to take off? In the early days, zero, literally none, uh, because we just, we didn't have any traction. And the first two or three years, you know, that was one reason why we, we self-funded the business. Um, you know, in 2013, 14, when we were building it, uh, the idea, you know, was that you raise a round of, it, of uh, angel funding and then a series A, B, C, and D. And, and we kind of dipped our toe into that game, but we got no response, no traction. And, and, and most, most reason why is because we're from Nashville, Tennessee. There's, there's not a big venture capital pool here. And all of the outbound we were doing on the, on the West and East Coast, you know, we were just getting crickets. So we were like, well, we better put our heads down and, and go to work. And then after we started making our first $10,000 a month in revenue, and 30 and 40 and getting 50,000 a month in revenue, we were like, well, why would we waste time raising money when we can put that energy into growing the business? And I mean, we're raising a seed check every month now. Let's just do more of this. It's working. And, and so we never look back. Now, now you know, we turn down. I mean, there's a, there's a venture capitalist in my email box every day. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, sometimes I respond, sometimes I don't. But, uh, but now we don't need funding. There's no reason for us to raise capital. Fitz Blackstone, maybe just drop a reply, say, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> if it's a soft bank or a tiger or something like that. You know, and a lot of times I will get on the phone. I will get on the phone with 
with VCs uh, sometimes because they're just flat out smart people and you always can learn something from them. And so sometimes that is time well spent, but if it's a junior associate, you know, they're only, their only, their job is to pound the phones. You know, that's always, that's a waste of everybody's time for us. Deal blow. But uh, yeah, yeah. But you know, if it's, if it's, if it's somebody who's been around the block um, yeah, I'll talk to them because I can always learn something. That's good. You definitely, you definitely carry that spirit about you of, uh, constantly learning, adapting, growing when you were, when you were managing 150 employees, did you, did you go to school to have any background for that? Or did you just go straight from high school and jump into this business and it just kind of took you along with it? Or how did that go? Yeah, it's, uh, nobody teaches us how to be a founder. Nobody teaches us how to be a leader. Nobody teaches us how to be a manager. And so you kind of have to learn these things on the fly, particularly if you're founding a business. And, and that's one of the cool things about starting your own business is uh, you will evolve into a whole new person every two or three years. At least that's mm. been my experience. You know, you look back five years ago where you were at, and you're not even the same person. And, and that's a great thing about starting yeah. your own business is that the marketplace is going to require you to, to level up. And so, so for me, a lot of times, my journey has just been like this series of like blocking and tackling of, okay, well now I have five employees and now, you know, I'm, I'm the culture of the business matters and I'm having to do weekly standups and I'm having to figure out how to lead these people towards one, one mission. So you start reading books on leadership. You start going conferences on leadership. You start learning uh, from other mentors uh, on how to be, you know, cultivate your leadership style. And, uh, and then maybe you get pretty good at that. And then now you're like, well, now I got to be a pretty good recruiter. And so now how, now you read, you know, books on how to, how to out recruit your, your competitors and how to level that game up. And so it's always this, this journey of like blocking and tackling for whatever skill set you need at that stage of the game and being like 80, 20 good at a dozen different things has been my style, you know, doing this for 20 something years. And, and that's one of the things I love about it. I never in a million years would have picked up a book on, I don't know, like copywriting or data analysis or things like that. But there's been stages of the journey that required that of me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I've learned that you can pretty much learn anything if you apply yourself to it. What was your main engine for growth when you guys were, so I'm going to split that into two questions. So when you were growing the lawn care business, which is more the brick and mortar boots on the ground, cause we have, we have all sorts of different people who listen to the show. Um, so on that side, what was your main engine for growth on the brick and mortar side of your business? Yeah, I think every business, small, large tech, blue collar, analog, digital needs to have some sort of flywheel uh, growth flywheel at the core of the business. What is the business doing and what is the natural exhaust of the business that, that is causing it to grow? And so in my first company, it was probably year six that I, that I started to really understand that we weren't in the landscaping business. We were a sales organization. Dang right, we, were, we were really like, I mean, that's, it, it doesn't matter what you're selling. You have to have a process, a repeatable framework and I really started to key in on, okay, what is the flywheel in the business and how do we, how do we use that to sell more work and get more customers and take more market share and grow and grow the business. And, and so I started developing a sales team and I myself had to become the sales manager and I became a decent sales manager for a while. And then I, then I was able to get my own sales manager to run it and, and run our process, run our sales process. And we had the flat out best sales process in our little market. You know, we, we, beat the pants off of our competitors in terms of prospecting and presenting. And, and, and we had a stronger value proposition than our competitors did. And, and nobody else was doing that at that time in the landscaping business uh, and in our market, Nashville, Tennessee. And so that, that was the engine of growth. Fast forward to, you know, today, Green Pal, we don't have a sales team. You are not an, an outbound sales organization. We're an inbound sales organization we have to develop traffic uh to come to our, our main property and and uh and the way we do that is through organic seo we have bet the entire company on creating a property that generates traffic uh that that gets clicks that gets eyeballs when somebody's looking for a lawn mowing service so hmm. if somebody's looking for a lawn mowing service in lincoln nebraska you know they go to google or one of the options you can consider uh, when you type that into your browser and, and doing that in every small city and town and major city in the United States is, has been one of our core competencies. And so uh, there's a saying that first time founders worry about product 
and second time founders worry about distribution. And if you have done this before and now you're a second time founder, you, you, you know the product's got to be good. You know that's table stakes, but you're asking questions around, okay, well, how are we going to get people to use this? How are we going to get people to find out about it? How are we going to drive awareness about it? How are we going to get people to, to try it out? And because all these other things don't even matter until you can figure that out. And that's been the way I've experienced it with GreenPal was, you know, it didn't matter how good our product was. If we couldn't get people to sign up and use it, it didn't matter. It was dead on arrival. How do you guys make money today? Is it uh, subscription based or excuse me, is it subscription based? Are you taking uh, money on the transaction and providing a transaction for the platform? Yeah. So we're a true marketplace connecting buyers and sellers and we are embedded into that payment flow. So we take a small transactional fee for all of the work that vendors do on the platform. And that varies depending on how much volume they're pushing through the platform. So a guy that's only doing a thousand dollars a month, uh, pays a different rate than a guy that's doing fifty thousand dollars a month. Very cool, and so that's you. You brought up something super interesting, which I believe is foundational to business owners in really, really twenty twenty two and beyond. Is organic SEO. Um, I think SEO kind of went through this uh, wavy period of where it was really black box, and you had basically bad actors, in my opinion, that were taking advantage of small businesses saying, we're going to pump up your SEO. And they were taking that money and not really doing anything of value with it. What did you do specifically to pump up the quality of your organic SEO and to start like basically start ranking at the top for a lot of these top search queries? Yeah. SEO for, you know, even today, there's a lot of bad actors. It's just, it's just, uh, it's tough because SEO is a lot like many things in life. If you do things hard, if you do the hard things, it'll be easy. If you do the easy things, it'll be hard. And SEO is no different. It's it's very much a long game. It, it's it very much uh, is an exercise of faith at times. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like, it's almost like dieting and fitness and, and physical fitness. Like you go to the gym one time, you come home, you look in the mirror, you look no different. But yet you still go to the gym tomorrow and, you know, you still get up and you still do these things day in, day out. And then over time, you start to notice results. And that's how SEO really is. And for us, you know, we've always we've always tried to take the long view and and not that not that we'll go for the quick wins. We will. But always try to, like, not take the shortcuts, even though the shortcuts are working today. You know, there, there is a uh, there's a movement in SEO now for AI driven content, which basically means you throw some keywords in, in a machine and, it, and, a, and this AI generator will, will kick you out of an article. And there's literally pe- practitioners in SEO talking about this as a strategy. And I'm like, there's no way that's going to work a year from now or two years from now. You know, so always taking the long view and just flat out creating the best content for whatever the search query is. And starting like really super niche and long tail has been our strategy. And so when we first started, rather than going after like key phrases like lawn care on a nationwide level, we went after key phrases like lawn mowing service and not just Nashville, but like Brentwood, Franklin, uh, Murfreesboro, Lebanon, Clarksville. These are towns around Nashville. And so like going super long tail and just, and just starting from the, bottom up and building it from from that kind of foundation is how we attacked it. And then over time, we were able to develop the authority uh, in our space and in our domain and then start to go after Nashville, Atlanta, Tampa, Chicago, things like that. But we very much took it from the bottom up. Fascinating. Are you guys running any sort of like paid campaigns right now to boost that? Or is it literally just organic SEO? For consumer side, for homeowners needing a lawn mowing service, the only way we get new customers is 50% of the people come to find out about us through Google or Nick search. The other half is word of mouth. And we find that works for us. We have dabbled with, with paid acquisition. Um, and we just cannot get the economics to, to sort out. You know, you're, you're, you're competing a lot of times in paid ads for fa- in Facebook or Google. You're competing with practitioners that, either they have a huge budget and don't care or they have a really small budget and don't know what the hell they're doing. And so you're kind of stuck in the middle. And if you're really trying to put a dollar in and, and get a dollar 50 out, it, a lot of times it's, it's, you put a dollar in and, and uh, you get 10 cents out. And so it's, it's not something that's worked for us. Uh, maybe at some point in the future, we'll, 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 we'll figure it out. But 
we've always like gone like boomeranged back to SEO and, and said, well, you know, rather than throwing ten grand at Facebook ads, let's throw ten grand at more quality content. Let's throw ten grand at like at like a, 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 a digital PR. Uh, uh, so we can get some more backlinks uh, and we always get better ROI, you know, going after the organic traffic than we do the paid. Interesting. I want to take a step back to the more analog or the brick and mortar side of your first business. What was the name of that company? It was called Peachtree Landscaping. And uh, that was the name of it for 15 years. And, and it still exists today. The, the people it. that bought it still, still run it and they're making they're making more money than I ever made running that business. So they're, they're doing good. <laughs> so Peachtree, when you were building that up and you were, you were becoming the sales manager, you were becoming the leader by reading these books, going to these conferences, what were the things that you were teaching to your salespeople that you were learning at these conferences to help them basically build themselves up as salespeople? Because you said you were a sales organization that happened to yeah. help you with landscaping, right? The main thing that, that I, I was able to do and the style that I was able to take was putting people in roles of kind of the, the funnel, I guess you could say, and, and, and identifying it that it was a step-by-step -step process. Because uh, when we started, it was one guy doing everything. He was prospecting, you know, then he would set the appointments and then he would go out and pitch and then he would go try to like nag them to close. And then after we closed them, he would have managed the account. And as time went on, you know, I was able to figure out that, no, we need, we need like two or three people prospecting and setting up appointments. Then we need this guy who's really good at presenting and that's all he does. Then we need this guy to, to, to go along with him to help close the deal. And then we need this other uh, person guy or, you know, or gal as the account manager and really kind of splitting that out and, and, and focusing on training people to work my process because I had done all of these things. And, and so like, this is how we do it here. This is why we do it this way. And this is how we're going to measure your, your success or failure. And it took me five years to, to, mm -hmm. to create that process. What, you know, by the time I sold the business, there was, we had a sales team of uh, like seven people uh, all in, and it was a good little humming sales organization. You know, we were doing eight figures a year in revenue and, and uh, we were flat out outselling our competitors. And then the other thing, you know, there was, there was just, there was, and there were some other heuristics that we had in there too, is like, we would call people back in an hour, no matter what, and our competitors were taking a day. And so mm -hmm. that was one thing like on the, on the, pro, on the, uh, on the, on the appointment setting time was like, we had a, a, a speed to response, uh, baked into the culture of the business that was just flat out better than our competitors. So, so there's no one silver bullet to these things. You have to like, look at the competitive landscape. What are my competitors doing? And how can I break this out into a repeatable process and just flat out out execute my competitors is how we did it. And it was no one special like silver bullet. It was just doing it and executing well. And it took a long time to figure it out because, because back then, you know, that was 15 years ago. There, there was no online classes for this sort of thing. There was no YouTube university. You know, we had conferences, we had books and that was it. Um, yeah. and, and so I kind of had to cobble it together. Totally. Did you have, when, when you were building that up, are you naturally the process guy or did you find yourself just executing and then forgetting to write process or it was always secondary or tertiary in your mind or did you make that a priority after a certain point? Yeah, I'm the naturally get stuff done guy. I, I hate when things are stagnant yeah. and not happening, and yeah. <laughs> and I hate log jams. I uh, really hate log jams, and 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 so we we had this all laid out on a whiteboard where 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 leads were flowing from from initial stages all the way to presentation and close and and customer and retain customer. And, and so I could visualize it. Now you can do this with a dozen, you know, project management uh, tools. But back then it was, it was all pen and pad and, and whiteboards. And so when things were stuck in the process, it really pissed me off. And so I would try to figure out ways to, to unstuck them and, and unstick them. And then also figure out why they got stuck in the first place. And, and I still carry this through to, to, to this day, uh, building green pal is, is, is asking like, if you're a process person, you're trying to get stuff done. Like, when things aren't happening properly, you, you ask why five times. Okay, well, why didn't this person get called back? Well, because um, the, they left a voicemail, but I didn't see it. Well, why didn't you see it? 
Well, because I was just busy. Okay, well, why why didn't you why didn't you uh, check your voicemail? Well, uh, this other this client called me, and um, the account manager actually didn't call them back. Oh, okay, so this is an account manager problem. This is not a salesperson problem. So this is just asking why five times, and, and you'll get to the root cause of things. You do that over and over again. You know, that's how you get a, a flywheel going. Fascinating. That's a really interesting, um, interesting way of handling it. Just asking why five times until you get to the root of the problem. Yeah, it's that- a it's a to- Toyota lean manufacturing methodology uh, that came up with that back in the in the sixties or seventies when they started beating the pants out of uh, off of uh, consumer of uh, American car makers is they would get to the root cause of, of problems by asking why five times in their manufacturing process. So it's a good little heuristic that I use today and always have in my businesses. Do you buy into their ideology around pods as well? Have you heard of that? You, you know, I, I, yes, yes. At different stages of the game, you know, like I'm a big zero to one one guy and and i'm like we got this thing we don't have anything how do we get to something and and so you know in in a in a at scale business yes but when you're trying to get something going from scratch you kind of just have to be a jack of all trades and you have to be pretty good at everything and do all these things yourself and then you can delegate these things to 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 specialists and practitioners. One of my favorite books is the, is the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. It's such a great book. And that's really what that book is about, you know, is yep. developing an org chart. And as you might say, well, I don't need an org chart. I don't have any employees. Well, still develop an org chart. There's a head of HR. There's a head of sales. There's a head of customer service. There's a head of R&D. There's a head of uh, operations management. And it's your name on every one of these roles. And, and then as not. time goes on, you peel your name off. And, yeah, that to me makes a lot more sense for small business, and and uh, it's such a good book that I think should be revisited at least once once every couple of years for by, by founders. Hundred percent. Do you buy into traction or any sort of operating system specifically at GreenPal? Yeah, yeah. We uh we we find things that work, we put them into place, and then we don't mess with them. And so for us, you know, we we have picked uh ruby on rails is, is what the platform is built on and, cool. and and you know that's what our developers are trained on we have 42 people working for the company now and we don't if it, it, it you know we don't try to innovate on on technology we don't try to innovate on things that have already been figured out we try to figure out ways to bring innovation to this little corner of the world which is the lawn mowing space, you know, like not a whole lot of people innovating in, in lawn care, you know, how do we make lawn mowing faster, cheaper, smoother, more reliable, more convenient for consumers. That's really where we focus on, on mm-hmm. innovating. Fascinating. And so you guys, are you using some sort of like core process as far as like agile when you guys are building out your applications in order to iterate and improve? Uh, past versions or how's that working for you right now it's always it's like it's never done and it's always an iterative process to to make the whole thing better smoother and faster but the problem is one thing that you that we find is is a challenge when figuring out like how do you prioritize improvements and how do you prioritize initiatives and how do you how do you prioritize where you're focusing your resources uh, because when you when you've reached a certain amount of scale, like like we're we're three hundred thousand people using it, thousands of transactions every day, a lot of what can bog down your iterations is just small fixes that people are are complaining about. Yeah, and you can literally put like a half a dozen engineers on just small fixes that don't move the needle. And when in fact you really need to be focusing on like these things that are important but aren't urgent, and 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 so that that's like the next big feature the next big thing that causes like the, the, the whole paradigm to shift. That's what you need to be focusing on. And these things that are small and like kind of like flies around you that are, that are aggravating you, you really don't need to worry about them. You need to be, you need, cause those are, those are, those, those things are, are urgent, but not important. Right. You need to be focusing on the things that are important, but aren't urgent. And so for us, you know, we, we had a big initiative that we've been, took us a year to build where it was, it was, it was a feature called Instabook because okay. typically you got to sign up, get quotes for your yard. Uh, it takes, takes about maybe sometimes 15 minutes, could take an hour. 
And then you hire the contractor you want to work with. Well, we started crunching the numbers and we're like, you know, in a lot of markets, we can offer an Instabook solution where we know your yard is 12,000 square feet. We know it's going to be $33. You can book this contractor now. And as simple as that sounds, it took us a year to build it. And so while we were building that, it was like we had tons and tons of things that were urgent, but not important that we had to ignore to build this one big thing. And so, uh, you know, as you're running like a, a lean, agile team and you're trying to figure out the things that are important to, to work on, that can be sometimes like a, almost like a, uh, an art form in terms of, of guessing and making bets. You know, startups are, are like poker and less like chess. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're not, you're not making these like really like elegant chess moves on the chessboard. You're, you're making kind of like, you know, go with your gut and, and calculating numbers on the fly. Like you are moves in, in poker. Yeah. And, uh, and so a lot of like product development is, is a lot like making bets on in poker. It seems like. And how, how did you make that transition from managing a team of really just laborers, managers, and salespeople to, software developers because those are extremely different personalities it was it was challenging it was like going from a blue collar entrepreneur to a tech entrepreneur because you you were the blue collar entrepreneur you were managing yeah. yourself right you're a young yeah, version of yourself yeah. yeah not only that uh but you know as it was it was a traditional business in in every sense you know i had three mechanics uh <laughs> that were working for me you know like literally guys that were changing transmissions and trucks and fixing lawnmowers and things like that. And I went from that world to, you know, trying to figure out how do you lead a team of, of engineers and developing on Ruby on rails. And, and that, uh, that took a long time, it took three years, I guess, for me to go from not knowing the first thing about how to build a piece of software to running a team of, of over, well, by year four, we had over 10 people and now we're 40, 42. So that took a while. And, and the way I did it was I had to learn it myself first. Hmm. I, I, I learned the hard way that you can't delegate something that you've never done yourself. Um, you have to delegate from a standpoint of stewardship. So I, I, had, to, I had to learn how to be a decent software engineer. I, I took, a, took classes online, went to YouTube University, took every online course I could to become the world's worst front end uh, coder. And then my, my <laughs> co-founder, my co-founder, uh, went to school, uh, to become a backend dev. And, and between the two of us, we hacked together the first version of green pal, but we were able to then build a team around us the right way. We were able to, then we understood, okay, this is what we're looking for. This is how we do things. This is why we're, these are certain qualities we're looking for. And so when you're delegating, like you, you can delegate from abjuration, which is, I don't know how to do this. It scares me. I don't like doing it. You handle it. Right. That's usually that's usually a uh, that's usually not going to work out correctly. Right. Uh, usually a recipe for disaster. But you want to get to a point of delegation from stewardship, which is, I know how to do this. This is how we do it. This is why we do it this way. This is how long we think it should take. Um, this is how we're going to score the quality and 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 score your your performance. And here. Now you handle it. That's stewardship delegation. You want to get to the point where you can delegate from, from that standpoint and not abdication. That's so good. Guys, if you are at the gym right now or you're in your you're in your car, I would just highly recommend everyone pause and go back the last 30 seconds to a minute of what Brian just shared with us because that is pure gold. I've actually never heard anybody say that before. Delegation from the lens of stewardship versus delegation from the lens of abjuration because, and, and I've done both. Ooh, I have too. <laughs> it's, it's not. And, and I know it's ugly. It's ugly. <laughs> so in our, in our business, in our business, what we do at grindstone. So I podcast of course, and that's why you're here, but at grindstone, we have um, a video production, paid advertising and podcasting. Those are the three core things that we do. So we help entrepreneurs launch and, scale their own podcast. And if I did not have this understanding of how this conversation was supposed to go, if I didn't understand all of the technology on a basic level, that would be really scary to just delegate and be like, well, it's up to you now. In fact, I, yeah. we have a studio across the, across the hall and I wanted to basically continue to speed up my ability to produce episodes. So I literally just crafted this setup around my office and he said, you know what? I'm going to put together a program that actually helps entrepreneurs do exactly what I did. 
set up all this high tech stuff around their office. So that way they don't have to rely on somebody else if they don't want to, but yet they can continue to keep their quality up. And I just, I just can't imagine coming at that from a perspective of not knowing anything about the technology or anything about podcasting. So that's such an excellent way of bringing that up. Sadly, you got to do it wrong first before you learn that lesson the hard way. And, you know, I've, when we first started green pal, we paid a dev shop to build the first version oh, and man. we wasted almost $200,000 doing it. And so <sighs> we had to learn that lesson the hard way. And every time I try to delegate something that I don't know how to do, it never works out. Are you ever challenged on that? Like you have like entrepreneurs that are like maybe ahead of you in certain aspects, whether it's monetary or other ways, like, do you ever have other people challenge you on that belief? Not entrepreneurs that have done it. Um, okay. You know, yeah. Even, that's, you, that's, if, you said if, it right you, there. Yeah. If you look at like, I mean, I guess that the gold standard would be like Elon Musk. And, and I don't mean trying to like put rockets on Mars. What I mean is like, look at Elon Musk. That dude can like walk around the, the Tesla manufacturing floor and he can speak to, to an engineer working on battery life. He can speak to, you know, a process engineer. Here on on the manufacturing line, he can probably talk about to the person in the paint booth on the alchemy on the paint, and then he can go over to SpaceX and he can literally hold a conversation with the with the top ranking uh, rocket scientists in the building. The dude can he's like eighty twenty good at all these things, and it's really hard to build a team around you of of, of rock stars unless you are. It's it's mm. it's hard. Either you get lucky or it doesn't work out. Um, and I've never gotten lucky doing that. <laughs> that's a really fascinating. That's a that's a really fascinating point because if you're going to hire around those people who are more amazing at you than those things, oftentimes that would revolve them or involve them actually being partners in the company. Right. And that's obviously yeah. when you can let your guard down because they are monetarily invested and time invested with you inside of that. Yeah, a lot of. Uh you know, a lot of what being a founder is, is building scaffolding around you. And, and, uh, I mean, hell you, you look at like Facebook, like why is Facebook blue? That's the color that Mark Zuckerberg picked when he coded up the first version. Why is Facebook written in PHP? Well, that's the, that's the language that Mark knew. Um, and a lot of these things are like are, are scaffolding built around you and you know, I mean, you can kind of get, you can get co-founders that kind of shore up the things that you're not good at. Um, but a lot of times you're better off learning it yourself and, and then delegating it to somebody who's better at it than you are. Man, that's so interesting. I just did this with, uh, kind of up leveling our paid advertising and paid media side of what we do in our business. And I got to tell you, that was one of the most fulfilling and most rewarding things that I did was actually go back and put myself through a formal ed education with somebody who spends, I don't know, north of a hundred million dollars per year in paid ads. And wow. Wow. yeah, Incredible. yeah. And he's in his uh, late twenties. So Incredible. absolute stud. He's on the, he'll, his uh, episode is actually right before yours. So um, Ashton Shanks, if you want to come listen to it, but those guys are killing it over at Heman. And um, what's interesting about that is like, it was so rewarding for me to go back and actually pour myself into this craft that, you know, I had started out knowing a little bit about when I started my company, we, we had a creative agency that also did the paid advertising side. And I was like, man, I really, I have a deep desire to like learn this fuller and truly be the expert. And now you're really validating that for me. Like you're really putting a lot of sense to why I decided to do that. And it was because I wanted to delegate from a point of being um, a good shepherd rather than right. Wow. That's such an, yeah. Unlock. Yeah. And, and this concept, uh, I learned it from the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by, by Dr. Stephen Covey. And he has a whole chapter on delegation. So check that out if, if you know, you're listening to this and you're like, man, that's a really good concept. That, it comes from that book. And that, to me, is one of, my, it's one of my favorite books on just how to be an effective leader, effective founder, effective person. Uh, there's a whole chapter on that. It's mm, good. What other books are so good you've read them twice? You, you know, something I struggle with is like trying to trying to pick get my hands on everything and consume everything uh versus just like picking five books and just like listening to them or reading them over and over again like i, I think like we learn more uh in a given month uh in terms of like consuming content than probably a person 40 years ago learned in a year or maybe 10 so sometimes i struggle with that um 
so to your point, uh, Seven Habits Highly Effective People was one of those books I listen to on Audible or try to read at least once a year. E Myth by Michael Gerber is another one. Uh, Good to Great uh, is is a timeless business book and the concept of the flywheel effect that. And so I think if you can just get your your hands on maybe three, four, or five books, make those the core of like your philosophy and belief systems and 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 how you approach life and and business, and then maybe rotate another four or five in, you know, on an ongoing basis, I think can be helpful. But I think, I think you have to have like that course set and that you revisit and you're learning over and over and over again versus just like picking up all the new stuff and it goes in one ear and out the other. That's, that, that, that's what I'm, that's the way I've experienced it. Like I, I've, I try to read at least a book a month, sometimes two. And then like last year, there's only a couple that really stick out, you know, and so that's that's what I'm trying to work on now, like honing, like what are those what are those core like sets of 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 knowledge and information, and then like rotating in some new stuff and having a balance between the two. That's but good. It's tough. That's good. That's super good advice for anybody, and I I really agree with that. Finding your foundational materials of what you believe, and I think that that also plays into who you want to be as an entrepreneur, because there's more than one ways to skin that cat. You can be, right. um, you know, there's if you surround yourself with knowledge, people, experiences, et cetera, that are only mapped around VC funded businesses, like I have a friend that, that is in that world, they're absolutely killing it right now in the, uh, in the transportation and factoring business. And like his whole world is all around that. Everything yeah. is like high growth, high cash, explode the business, sell it for a billy, get out. And yeah. then you have the other side of that coin, which I would put myself in that camp of where I'm around a lot of small business owners who are building self-funded businesses that eventually will probably sell to PE someday, or you know maybe hold and continue to build uh, other businesses with the equity I've put in with that business and use it as kind of a machine to then point at the other ones. And so I think that's a really good point that you know you're not just the average of the five people you hang around; you will become the average of what you consume. And yeah. that's a it's a good way of putting that. I, I like the way you have illustrated those two worlds. And I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. Yeah. I think you have to go all in on on one though. And yes. you have to like embody <laughs> and pick. And like it almost doesn't matter which you pick, but you need to pick one and go all in on it. You can't like dabble in one and then dabble in the other. And uh and and so I, I like that I like the how you put that. And then the other thing is is over like the last decade, making this transition from blue collar entrepreneur to tech entrepreneur. There's been about a dozen or maybe 20 or 30 different people that have mentored me asynchronously, mm. meaning like I have consumed everything they have put out on YouTube, every yeah. like keynote they ever made. Who, who are those people? Every, I'm so curious. Uh, tra- Travis Kalanick, the CEO, uh, co-founder of, uh, of Uber before yeah. he was forced, forced out, um, is a guy that I learned a lot from. There's actually a show coming out about him on, uh, on Hulu called uh, Super Pumped. Um, no which I don't way. think paints him in a, yeah, I don't think paints him in a very good light to be honest, but, That's but, uh, wild. I mean, that was somebody who I learned a lot from Brian Chesky, CEO of, of, of Airbnb. Um, but then, but then going like long tail, like who are the people that these guys and, and gals hired, like at the practitioner level, like who was head of growth at, at Pinterest and, and Grubhub in the That's early good. days, like, you know, who was head of girl and like, let me listen to what this guy's putting out. And, and, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, and then, you know, it's a guy by the name of Casey winners. And, and this guy talks about SEO for marketplaces and that's the guy I need to learn from. He's, he's talking about how to build an SEO team, how to execute, uh, for organic traffic when building a marketplace. And I mean, literally this dude's done it. So I, I have, I have learned so much from this, this guy, another dude named Andrew Chen, who is, was head of growth at Uber, who's now a venture capitalist, uh, he just he just wrote a book called the uh, the cold start problem, which is really good about how do you get over the cold start in a marketplace. Mm. So, so uh, I think you can be mentored and be the average of five people, even though maybe you've never met them. Totally. Um, you yeah. know, in terms of like l- consuming everything they have put out and <laughs> and going to YouTube University and and finding their stuff. What That's a time funny. to be alive. Dude, hundred percent. When I was, uh, so I was doing door to door sales, selling commodity risk management services for my good friends here in Lincoln. And, um, in that process, I basically became 
asynchronously mentored by Andy Frazella, Gary V, Ed Milet, and let's see who else. It was primarily those three for like a long time, like every and, single episode. And they episode. probably helped you level up your thinking, level up your goal setting, level up the way you look at life. I mean, you know, 20 years ago when I was first getting started as a, as a founder, we didn't have access to people that were mm -hmm. at a different level than we were. You know, you had your little like local community and your local networking. And that was, you know, maybe you go to a conference, but, but uh, literally like you would have to buy like CDs and tapes. Tony Robbins, bro. The books yeah. on tape. <laughs> yeah. I mean, good. there's, there's no excuse these days. There really no. isn't. No, there's really not. I actually have a really, uh, really good question for you on that note about reading about Brian Chesky and, uh, Travis and all those guys from when they were like pre IPO. Are you reading like their S1s and 10K paperwork to actually understand pre-IPO what they were looking like or what 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 all are you studying from them when you start? The earlier the better. Gotcha. Uh, is 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 what I what I have found is, you know, listening to a talk today, listening to Brian Chesky talk about how he is running Airbnb today, he might as well be on Pluto compared to where I'm at because I mean they're it's a hundred billion dollar company. Yeah. I want to know what were the things Brian did when the team was 10, 20, 30, first hundred people. Mm -hmm. Like those are the talks I want to listen to. That's good. Uh, because that's the stage of that, the game that I'm at. You know, we're, we're at $30 million a year in revenue. I want to listen to the guy who's at a hundred million dollars because that's where I'm trying to get to. Um, the guy that's at, 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 that's at 10 billion. Sure. It's interesting. And sure, there's a couple, probably a couple things that I can learn, but it's not applicable to where I'm at and what stage of the game that I'm at. So I think when you're trying to consume uh, content and learn from, from folks asynchronously, try to like figure out what level of the video game you're at. If you're at level three, then, then look, at, look at people at levels four, five, and six. Yeah. Listen to what they're putting out, read their stuff, their blog posts, and then, and then reevaluate on a, on a rolling basis. That's how it's worked for me. That's super good. Guys, I, I, I feel like this is going to be one where people like listen to that again, go back, listen to that again and really consume what Brian is sharing with us. Cause that is, that is incredibly valuable. What we just well, shared it's, there. It's, it's tough because you go to YouTube and, and 90% of it's crap Yeah, and you got to wade through the crap to get to the gold. So true. And once you, once you really dial in on, on people that are, that are talking about what it is you're trying to do. And you kind of get down that that rabbit hole, that that what in and, and that long tail, it can change your life. And the, the crazy thing is, it's like, like I'll listen to a, a, a there's a there's a conference uh, called uh, the Marketplace Conference, which is people building marketplaces and they come together. I, I can't, I mean, it's in it's in San Francisco every year. Maybe one year I might go to it, but it's like ten G's, and I, and and they put it all on YouTube, the entire <laughs> conference. Granted, it's six okay. months later, but <laughs> but I can listen to every keynote, and so and so I'm sitting here listening to a a a talk that that one of the first like growth growth leads at Uber is giving about how they deployed a billion dollars in of of paid marketing spend and how they developed the teams to do that and how they did that efficiently and how they figured out if they could spend a hundred million dollars on referrals and get more customers or spend $100 million on Facebook ads and get more customers? And which of these two developed more market share on a city-by-city -city basis? He is explaining how they did all of that. And then I look down, and this video is like four months old, and it has 12 views. <laughs> so it's like, it's like this stuff is out there. You just got to find it. Yeah, it is like I'm the 13th person to watch this amazing talk. And yeah. uh, so like that's an example of like, you, half of the YouTube battle is just, is just wading through all the stuff that that's that doesn't work, that's that's not valuable to you, and finding the stuff that does. Allocation is so critical when you when you're at your face. Like, where are you yeah, allocating spend for growth? That's a, a lot. Of, a lot of times, you uh, you know, at, when you get from like level one to level two as a as an entrepreneur, or three, four, five, six, you you a lot of what you do is capital allocation. Right. Um, and so on a daily basis, you're looking at, okay, how much money is coming in and how are we putting money back out to work to, to make more money? The, and the way that, that I have always kind of tried to stay on track is to close the gap between founder logic and customer logic. 
because there's this weird thing that happens as you grow. Like there's this gap that develops between the way you look at the business, the problem it solves, and the way you see the world versus how your customers uh, are looking at the, the business and the problem that you're solving. And the way I close that gap is I still do uh, at least an hour, sometimes two or three hours a day of customer service. So I still, I'll still answer the, the main phone number. Mm-hmm. I will still do the live chat. I'll still do email tickets. And just that simple thing, wow. as simple as that sounds, really crystallizes my thinking in terms of, okay, okay, this is where we need to improve. This is where we need to take the business. If we're going to get to a hundred million, these are the opportunities. Like the idea for Instabook was like constantly looking at, okay, people were dropping off and not coming back and hiring the prices they got, even if they were 15 minutes later. And so constantly talking to customers closes the gap between founder logic and customer logic and it informs my bet making. Like, am I going to hire a better copywriter? Am I going to hire a better designer? Am I going to hire uh, uh, another SEO lead? Like, where am I going to make these bets with this little bit of money I got? And the way I, I, ha- I develop the gut instinct is but just by talking to sometimes hundreds of customers per day. I think that's so smart. I think it's absolutely brilliant to have your ear to the ground that way. Um, and I've, I've heard that from several, several founders of massive companies, even like the ones that I was being virtually mentored by is hopping on the phones, whether it's sitting with the sales team, whether it's, uh, you know, if it's a factory going out on the line and being like, why are we doing it this way? Uh, I think that that's something that was super valuable. Brings me back to like, uh, have you heard that? Have you heard the story about Charles Schwab? And uh, when he had his steel mills and he was having the steel mills compete against each other. Oh, no. Tell me about that. This is super cool. So um, he was trying to understand why one of the steel mills was underperforming massively because they were roughly the same square footage and roughly the same size. But one of them was doing like, let's see, one of them was doing like four per day. And one of the other one and four is just like a load number. I don't remember how big or what they were doing, but the arbitrary number is four. And one of them was doing one per day and very similar size. So he basically went out there and it was just like asking them questions. Like, why is this not, why is this not working? You guys have similar efficiencies. There's similar equipment. There's, um, you have the same amount of time in a day. You're not working shorter shifts. You have the same shift time. And actually, I'm sorry. It was, uh, it was shift one versus shift two. So it was the exact Ah. same facility. Sorry. And, uh, so shift one was doing one. The other one was doing four. And so what he did is this is the most like brilliant thing ever. It's the theory of competition. He took a giant piece of chalk and he wrote the number two on the floor that day for a shift one. And so shift one completed two giant loads of steel. So shift two, the night shift gets in there and they're like, what's with the giant two? It's painted on the floor. <laughs> And, uh, awesome. their, their supervisor told them, well, this is what shift one was able to do. And, um, you guys only did one. So we're going to see, you know, let's see if we can beat them. And they just kind of like, they put it out there and then they let them internalize the fact that they were underperforming against the first shift, but they had no idea that that was the case. Um, and so the story ends with, <laughs> they became the most profitable, high volume steel mills in the industry. And I think, I think, what did they say? They were doing North of 12 loads by the end of the competition. That's, each. Uh, that's amazing. Isn't that yeah, cool? Sometimes, sometimes just, sometimes just getting out and like, he wouldn't have come to that realization. Had he not walked the floor Yeah. and you know, had he not gotten out there and seen it for himself. You know, it's like that, that show Undercover Boss is so hilarious. Like they yeah. like, like like the CEO gets in, you know and starts working the front line at Dunkin' Donuts and they're like, What? This is the way we do this? This is insane. It's so dumb. They- <laughs> yeah, what a waste of time. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. That show is I mean, like like it's, it's so as silly as it sounds, like talk to your customers. You know, as as trite as that sounds. No, it's like I have to force myself. I don't want to do two hours of customer support every day, but I force myself to do it because I know that's going to crystallize my thinking come bet time. I love that. You've got a, you seem like a very disciplined person. Just you, I mean, you're, you're interested in fitness. You're disciplining yourself to do a couple hours of customer service every day as the CEO of a pretty good sized tech company. How, how do you, how did you build that discipline over time? 
And second question would be, what are your routines every day to make sure that you're staying in that disciplined state? Well, that's a nice compliment. I'd like to tell you that I was like David Goggins style, you know, <laughs> disciplined, you know, like that yeah. might be the most disciplined dude, uh, on social media. Like, like, you know, no, I don't have that wiring. I just don't <laughs> have that wiring. Like I, I, I am not, I'm like the hardest working, laziest guy there ever was. And so for me, it's all about, um, consistency as a superpower. Mm. And it's about doing like the day the the, 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 the rudimentary repeatable things day in day out and looking at at like output metrics which is what we're trying to do where where we're trying to get to and then like okay put that aside what are the input metrics what are the things that i have to do on a daily basis what are the things that team members have to do on a daily basis to get to that output metric and then managing the input metrics and so whether it's it's just little little things like doing two hours of customer support every day or or getting up every morning and 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 doing some cardio so I feel good throughout the day and and so I don't I don't get overweight which I've been overweight at 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 times during the journey and I felt like crap and wasn't able to manage and lead well and then and then also creating the accountability like what I call trip wires uh, laid out in front of me to where I where where I have to do the things so so an example of like a trip wire you know I hate. I hate data. I hate spreadsheets. I'm not wired towards just want to like pour over a, a, a spreadsheet and work pivot tables and stuff like that. Hate doing that stuff. And so uh, what I did was, is I, I hired the best uh, data scientist that I could get my hands on. And she makes $325 an hour as a contractor. And I meet with her once a month uh, after she's done all of her analysis. And so I know when I'm getting ready to meet with her, I better have done my homework. I better have pulled all of the SQL queries and looked at all of the stuff and, 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 and this is why I can hit the ground running with her. And so just that, that one little tripwire, like reverse, uh, you know, it, it causes me to do all the things I need to do on a daily basis to be prepared for that one meeting. And that. if I didn't have that, you know, I, I would just be lazy about it. So that's how I kind of stay consistent. And then over time, these little things start to compound. I love that. Finding external accountability and trip wires to make sure that you're firing on the leading indicators. That's yeah. Good. And you may not have the money for the $300 an hour person. I, I, I certainly did it in the beginning. So then you look for cheap ways to do it. You know, yeah. maybe, you know, maybe there, there's a friend that you can make a, uh, make a, you know, uh, make a bet with, or maybe yep. there's an online community where <laughs> you have to be held accountable in that online community. Looking for these external ways to, to keep you on track is, has certainly helped me stay on track. I love that. And I think even having uh, having that with your team too, um, because yes. like if, if your team is a big, you know, lever for you, which is a entrepreneur 99% of the time, that is the lever that of, for growth is working with the team to help grow. If you can utilize your communication with them and deadlines with them to say, I will get this done. And then if you don't get it done, they have to see you fail. That's super painful mm. for good, well-disciplined entrepreneurs. Um, yes. You, you just, and also that benevolence to your team, you know, like not yeah. wanting to let them down, you know, like that, that can help keep you on track too. That's 100%. helped me a lot. That's good, man. Well, we're, we're kind of at the end of our time here. So I want to kind of, before I wrap this up, uh, I want to give people an opportunity to find you online and get subscribed to Green Pal. So if you could just tell us a little bit more about where to find you and how they can get started, that'd be great. Yeah, life's too short to cut your own grass. You know, work on your business. Don't mow the yard. So just download Green Pal in the App Store or Play Store. You get hooked up with a good service in, in a couple minutes. Uh, anybody wants to hit me up, Instagram, uh, you can reach me on IG, Brian M. Clayton. Just drop me a DM there. That's awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate hey, it. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed it. You bet, buddy. Uh, so, guys, Make sure you guys reach out to Brian. Let him know what you thought of the show. I know I've got a couple of friends in the landscaping and uh, lawn mowing business specifically. So those guys should definitely reach out to you and just, uh, gosh, if nothing else, just ask you ask you a question to like help them along their journey. And uh, guys, I would love it if you just leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcast and a review of what you thought of today's episode. If you've already left a review before, you can leave another review on today's episode. So please just encourage you to do that. 
and it's at spark to fire podcast everywhere. And uh, if you want to follow me, let me know what you thought of the episode. My Instagram handle is life of Landon on Instagram or find me at Landon Rhodes on Facebook. So that is all we got for today and uh, keep striking. <laughs>